Um, hi, uh, I'm Juri Kosina. I'm a distinguished engineer at SUSE, uh, and I'll try to make this a little bit more quick so that I don't cut off too much into your coffee break. But still, I would like to show you what we have been doing uh, in the area of uh, live kernel, Linux uh, kernel patching. But you have, as you have seen, the kernel is in the brackets. So we are currently extending our area of interest a little bit more. And I'll talk briefly about that as well. Um, so whenever any one of us who are working on this mentions that we are doing live patching, especially of the Linux kernel, but not necessarily only that, everybody basically asks, why are you doing it? Why? Why is it interesting to actually live patch it? Why don't you just reboot the machine? So that's something uh, I would like to talk about first, really briefly. Uh, and then we'll look a little bit into history, describe where we are currently, and look at what uh, are the missing features, either those which we are already working on or features that basically needs, need the proper thinking about and design still. Um, so there's this analysis. There are actually quite a lot of analyses by, by consulting companies. Uh, how expensive it is for enterprises and for manufacturing companies to actually uh, stop a production or reboot the whole data center, uh, whatever. And the numbers are really, really big. So we have been, before we started with the project, we have been really continuously approached by uh, these kinds of guys that they really have to have means about redu deal with plant uh, downtime. Plant, well, but plant means when there is a security issue, they usually have to plan months in advance to actually fit into, into the maintenance window when they would be able to properly and continuously gradually reboot the, the whole data center system, cloud, whatever they have. So this, this is where the life patching actually fits into the picture, so it's for things where you basically have to act outside of the regular maintenance window you have been uh, planning, doing your planning with. So it's incident response, and for especially useful for uh, security fixes, of course, where you have to basically act immediately and not wait three months before you plan the next, next maintenance window. All right. Um, history. So when I was thinking about when exactly the, the first idea of life patching came into life, uh, I think it was back then in 1940s. Um, I don't know who of you is familiar with Richard Feynman's book, uh, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, I think it's called. Um, uh, it's written by a physicist, Nobel Prize physicist, who has been working on uh, Project Manhattan that had been the construction of an atomic bomb. And in his book, it's a book about basically anyth anything and everything from his life, funny stories. But one of the stories actually is how they, they have been using punch cards. They had computers that were, uh, the programs have been punched into the punch cards. And it took them a lot of time when then it turned out that one of the punch cards is wrong. It took a long time to actually restart the whole process, repunch the cards and then refeed them to, to the machine. So that uh, they actually came up with an idea how to color uh, different groups of punch cards differently. And whenever it turns out that there is a bug in one of the groups, they just were able to replace that particular group, but the rest can be kept in the rotation of, of, of the machine. So I think that in principle actually is live patching, right? They didn't have to stop and restart the whole computation. They basically replaced a few of the punch cards while the computation was going on. So I think that's the first notion of actually um, program live patching. Then nothing happened for quite a long time. Uh, then KSplice appeared. KSplice uh, originally was a university project. Someone wrote it as his PhD. And it was based on stop machine, which is a mechanism in the Linux kernel that actually stops all the execution, forces all the CPUs to, to uh, the same loop. So that means that no CPU is executing anything interesting. And then it checks whether any of the CPUs was actually running any code related to the function that's about to be patched, and if it's by some algorithm uh, decided to be safe, the code is replaced and the execution is, is restarted. Um, the case splice project, after the person who wrote it originally uh, defended the PhD, uh, Oracle um, 
basically acquired him through his company. And now uh, KSpice is being commercially deployed for Oracle uh, Linux distribution. Um, in 2014, both Red Hat and SUSE uh, all of a sudden came, came up with their own solutions to, to how to do live patching. Uh, Red Hat uh, had a solution called KPatch, which was based on a very similar principle, stopping the machine, uh, inspecting the stacks of all the CPUs, and doing, doing the switch if, if safe. Uh, we at Suzette took a slightly different approach, uh, which we called uh, lazy migration. Um, I'll show a picture that explains the very basic principle. Uh, we are, so, so the remark I have there for KPatch, I, I know they did deploy it uh, as a Fedora uh, technical preview and they were shipping it uh, uh, in RHEL to some selected enterprise customers. I'm not sure what the current situation is so that Bullet actually might be wrong. Sorry for that. And we commercially deployed uh, KGraft in SUSE and already have distributed hundreds of patches in their way to our customers. Uh, and there is actually an alternative um, which is based on checkpoint restart, uh, if you're familiar with that. So basically cre the, one of the implementations that exists is CREU, which basically allows you to checkpoint the whole user space, so stop whatever is happening. Uh, the, the primary use case for CREU is something different. It's migrating uh, the running processes across machines, but it can be actually used or abused to, to do also live patching because you can actually freeze the whole user space, k-exec into the whole new kernel, and then restart the user space so that it, see, it has a notion that nothing happened. Um, the benefit, of course, it, is it allows you to exchange the whole kernel, which we will never be able to uh, achieve with the, with the, the live patching uh, facility we have in the kernel. Um, but there are also, also some uh, negatives to it, like you have to re reinitialize the hardware, and also it takes some time, naturally. Um, so this is the lazy migration scheme we have uh, implemented for KGraft. So basically the point we are, we are achieving here is that whenever a process enters a kernel, it's always guaranteed that the set of functions that is executed in this one path of the process through the kernel is always consistent. So it always calls, uh, calls functions only which are not, have not been yet patched or which are always uh, in the, completely in the patch state. So it doesn't intermix patched code with a not yet patched code. So there is a, there is a boundary uh, on, on the kernel space user space where uh, we mark the processes like it's entering the kernel so we can now use the, the, the fully patched set of functions and we install a trampolines that decide basically in runtime which version of the function to call. That's, it, it misses a lot of details, but that's the basic principle of how we uh, install the patch. And once we see that all the processes have actually crossed the user space kernel space boundary at least once, that means everybody can be now migrated to the fully patched state. Um, so th there we are, 2014-15, uh, two different implementations uh, of the same thing, which usually um, means that there would be some big flame war upstream, which of them will be merged. Um, uh, we had a live patching session uh, at Linux Plumbers in Dieseldorf, and we actually, together with Red Hat, uh, agreed to just basically cherry pick individual features from um, each of the implementations we had and gradually start working on merging them uh, upstream. And actually the basis for that was already merged into Linux S3 in February 2015 and we are still continuing. So there was still really basic infrastructure that basically only allowed for simple function redirection. And now we are adding features on top so that it, which allow us to actually apply more and more complex sets of patches with more complex properties. Um, that's exactly what I've said. Uh, so originally the, the live patching was available only for x86. We have so far extended to S390, which, which is IBM mainframe. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that, but it's quite popular in, uh, among some customers. Uh, PowerPC64, little NDN uh, has it currently, and ARM64 is in the works. I think the, the basic prototype already works pretty well. Um, and um, one benefit that actually resulted from all these efforts is that now x86 even has much more reliable stack, stack traces because we are actually 
in some extreme corner cases, we are actually looking at the, at the you know, stack traces of, of the processes, which are long sleeping in the kernel, for example, to make, to, for us to be able to make decisions. So for that, we actually had to improve stack tracing in the kernel. So now when you, when, when you have proper config, op config options turned on, uh, you will actually get since four, I think 12, you will get really 100% reliable stack traces from the Linux kernel, which wasn't the case before. You, whoever has seen any kernel stack trace before, you recall the question marks before the function names. That's what real, unreliable stack traces. So the unwinder wasn't sure whether what it's in the stack is actual stack frame or whether it's just random address uh, hanging around. So now, as a side effect of live patching, we have reliable stack traces. Uh, actually, we, we would have almost reliable stack traces when we would have enabled frame pointer, uh, which is code emitted GCC by, by the compiler, uh, which actually always pushes the frame pointer before calling a function, and then that means that you are always guaranteed to have the full uh, set of frame pointers uh, that would allow you to unwind the stack. Surprisingly, just turning frame pointer on brings up to 10% of performance degradation as measured by some. So there's no way we are turning it that on in enterprise distribution, so we had to come up with something else. Now, how, how we are actually creating the patches. So there is an infrastructure in the kernel, but that's not enough, right? We have to create the patches themselves. Um, uh, Currently, for the implementation that is upstream, uh, the patches are mostly created by hand. Uh, they, are, they come in the form of a simple C file that gets compiled into .ko, so standard kernel module. And it basically, at the time you insert the kernel module, uh, it initiates the, the process of the patching, and you can forget about it. It will eventually patch your kernel. So it only contains basically the implementation of the new function and calls the live patching API. Uh, to show you some examples, so this is how the regular non-live patch uh, one-liner uh, to the kernel might look like. So it patches the function that, that is executed when you do cat slash proc slash uh, command line, I think, which will show you the kernel command line the kernel has been booted with. And this, this regular source, source code patch would change it to show something different there. The live patch looks like this. So it's not that easy, but most of it is just really a boilerplate. The important thing is it com contains an implementation of the new function, so how it should behave, that's the first function, and then basically only registers this function, uh, uh, also the name of the function that's about to be replaced, and just registers this single structure with the live patching API, and the live patching infrastructure in the kernel handles the rest. So um, writing such a trivial live patch is really trivial. Um, now, to the more, uh, any questions to that? Okay, now to the more complex things, missing features, and things we um, still need to implement. Um, so as you have seen, we are easily able to exchange code. We just, it's basically just a simple code flow redirection. Um, but that's not what all the patches, like source level patches, are doing, right? They also change the layout of the data structures or locking semantics, and this is where this gets really tricky. Um, so we currently do have some ability to deal with data structure or semantic changes, uh, and there are, there are so, so just, just one side note. Now we are really entering uh, an area where uh, Implementations for some of the things I'm, I'll be mentioning here doesn't even exist or it exists in some really preliminary state. So ideas are welcome or if anyone is interested, just feel free to chime in and start contributing. So this is all basically under heavy development still. Um, so one of the ideas how to deal with the data structure changes, one of the easiest way is when we are basically adding a new field into the data structure and at the same time adding a code that uh, works with, the data with that field of the data structure, right? So one thing we can do is basically use the, the lazy migration uh, we have. Uh, that means that we introduce a new version of the function, like v2, the patched version, which is actually able to operate on both variants of the data and actually be able to distinguish which data it's seeing. 
And only after the, the migration is complete, it will then switch over and always using um, the, new, uh, uh, the, new, the new format of the data. Um, another thing that can be done and that we are currently, it's implemented and it's actually already upstream and we already shipped patches, uh, live patches that are using this facility, our shadow variables, which basically, the, the thing is it's, it's tricky to add a field into the structure because you never know how many gazillions of instances of that structure are already in memory, right? So you can't really find all the places where it would be possible, but that would be super complicated. So it's much easier to actually create a shadow structure, shadow variable that you use the, the key is the original structure and then the new code, the, the code you have installed, the new patched version, is actually using the, the old structure only as a hash or as a key to obtain the extra field we have added. So it's not added directly into the structure, but going through in direction, we are actually looking into a different memory. And that works pretty well, actually. A uh, problem that's not currently solved and it's probably unsolvable uh, is when we change uh, locking semantics. So when we are, for example, when the patch is actually changing the order in which the locks should be changed, that, that leads to immediate deadlocks because you would at one point have processes using one uh, ordering and the other process using the other ordering and that's immediate deadlock. So how to change that is if there is a way how to change it at all, it probably requires stopping the whole system, doing a really deep analysis whether any of, the, any of the affected locks are currently being held. If not, then the semantics could be changed, otherwise just give up, probably. Or, so that, that's something that needs to be still researched. We, we have no good solution for that. And uh, well, one interesting thing which currently is implemented and can be actually used to implement what, what I just mentioned, so inspecting the state of the whole system and making decisions on whether it is or it is not safe to apply a certain patch are patch callbacks. So it's possible, as you have seen here, um, uh, the KLP uh, func and KLP object is really, was really simple in this example. It already only contained pointers uh, to the old and new function but it could contain more and there is more in the API. So you can actually register callbacks which the, which the kernel live patching infrastructure will call into before it starts to apply the patch, during various phases of going through the application of the patch and when the patching is about to finish. So you can actually do certain transformations in memory on, on the data if it's safe. And that, that brings me, if it's saved, that's, that's a big thing. So that brings me to uh, actual verification whether the patch, the, the person, the author of the live patch has created, whether it's actually safe to be applied, whether it, it's when, if in compliance with the lazy migration uh, scheme. Um, there are actually much more things to watch for. Um, for example, static functions in the function scope, uh, static variables, sorry, static variables in a function scope. Those exist only once, right? But if we replace them with another uh, new function that would have the same static variable, you all of a sudden get a second copy, which wouldn't be synchronized with what you had in, in, that, uh, in the previous old function. So that's one thing. Another thing is patching a schedule. That's a completely different story. That's also a very complex thing for various reasons. Um, actually, also, um, compiler is making this very difficult for us. Uh, to, 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 to illustrate a problem, for example, inlining is a problem because if you want to patch a function that has been inlined somewhere else, you're in trouble, right? Because you can't because the function per se doesn't exist. Its code has been sprinkled over to some other function. Uh, so the way we do this, we have tools that actually, or we actually have patches to GCC that actually tell us what has been inlined to where, and then basically we build a transitive closure of all the functions we actually have to replace. So starting from a single function that is inlined everywhere, it means we have to replace a lot of code eventually. Uh, other interesting thing is uh, that GCC is doing um, some optimizations um, that make it also tricky because in cases where GCC uh, or any compiler in general is actually uh, sufficiently re um, like convinced it can break ABI of a particular function because no one else can ever call into that function because it's static and it, so that it 
knows about all the colors, it actually breaks with when you turn certain uh, compiler options on, it actually breaks the C ABI because it knows it doesn't have to maintain it because no one else is calling into it. And we have trouble with that as well because we might be actually willing to call into, into that function from our uh, newly instantiated patched function, right? So we have to know when compiler broke ABI for which functions and then avoid calling them. And again, we basically just do the trans transitive closure and uh, include those functions in the set of things we are we're patching. Um, uh, a lot of these things are currently being done manually, or there are some simple tools that help us to, to do the analysis, but there is no ultimate one binary or script that will do all this and tell us you need to do this, 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 and this, the patch violates this criteria. So there's, there's one, that's one area where a lot of work could still be done. Um, yeah, to just one interesting thing is k-probes as well, because just imagine you, you have put a k-probe, kernel probe, the probe that you want to trigger when particle function is executed in a kernel. You have put a k-probe on the function that you are then going to live patch. Um, then you are basically losing the k-probe because there's no way, uh, no automatic algorithmic way how to transfer the probe to the new function because the new function in general can look completely different. So there's no mapping from be bef between the location of the old probe and the location where the new probe should be put into the new function. So that probe is lost. How? Okay. <laughs> and another thing uh, is uh, that, that is still work in progress and probably ever will is extending uh, architecture coverage. So currently I named the four architectures we have the support for, but kernel obviously supports much more than these four architectures. And actually adding, um, adding support for architectures is pretty easy. You basically have to just teach that architecture about this F-trace with regs, which is one of the modes of operation of F-trace where it's actually saving and restoring registers, which is what live patching is actually building on top of. And then you have to make sure that the architecture provides you with reliable stack traces. This is architecture specific. Uh, it depends on how, on the ABI basically, on the way how the functions are stalling and, and uh, storing the pointers to where they are returning from a deep, deeper call chain to the, to the a more shallow call chain. So it might be for free on some architectures. I think S390, for example, is guaranteed to always have the completely full uh, frame and so that there's nothing to be done for S390 in this respect, but there are other architectures where we don't know yet. And then when F-Trace knows how to do saving and restoring the registers and when the stack traces are guaranteed to be reliable, then it's really as easy as writing a few tens, maybe a hundred of lines, not even a hundred, lines of uh, some glue code that actually hooks uh, to the F-Trace and performs the redirection and uses the live patching API. So extending to, to new architectures is easy once the first two uh, points are actually there. Um, inability to patch handwritten assembly. A kernel, of course, has a lot of such code, and currently F-Trace doesn't check it, right? Right? Um, um, dot .s, uh, functions in, written in, handwritten in dot .s files. We can't. Yeah. Yeah, F-Trace requ F requires the PG option, but yeah. so, we so could hand put them in. Which is what we actually did just for the same sake of experiment and it did work. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see why I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that, that's one of the limitations. Um, we can't easily do that. We can hack it around. And we actually did hack it around. And we actually did uh, create. So I, I'm not sure how, how many of you are familiar how complex the page table isolation patch set has been in the Linux kernel. It, it's been a lot of work. And we actually, just for the sake of fun and experiment, actually did implement the whole page table isolation as a live patch, which was a complete hack. I mean, it, it didn't even use the API that's, that's in there, almost, just for really the basic things, so that it, it has the sys, sysfs entry and so on. But otherwise, it requires to do us a lot of stuff like redirect all the IDTs to, to the new code that's then able to actually handle 
um, the old format of the PGDs and new format of PGDs. It was a real adventure, but actually it works now. So I think uh, the, the developer, Nikolai, who has been working on it actually already did or is planning to publish a just for fun article on LWN about how it actually was implemented, and it actually worked. So it's in principle doable, but the price, it basically, at the time we were done with that, no one really would be interested anyway because it took like three months to implement it, so. And the, the, the new field which we are currently entering is user space live patching. So we have people coming to us asking for the feature actually, so that they would like to, you can imagine, I mean, long running computations, long running databases, which are super, uh, which take super long time to actually restart. So they would like to be able to apply critical security fixes without, and then without restarting, and then eventually plan for a restart when, once the maintenance window is there. Um, there, are, there are multiple problems with that. First is there's no real boundary, which we are really relying on when, with the kernel live patching, so there's no real boundary between the user space and the kernel space. User space is just there. Um, and also the problem is that kernel is very GCC-centric, so we are making use of quite a lot of GCC specialties to make live patching possible, but user space is a wild forest, right? You have all of different compilers, Intel compiler, Clang, and so it's also makes it even more complicated. There are some, I've listed two projects which have been actually existing for quite some time. They're basically just inject, they use ptrace, so they, they hook up to the application basically pretending they are a debugger, and then they redirect a code flow and are done with that. But there's no real notion of consistency, and the, the set of patches you are able to apply this way is also very limited or specific. So we actually currently are, uh, currently are taking a slightly different approach, and we are basically in the first step at least not going to be able to patch everything. But in the first step, so if you look at what, where the most critical security issues in user space are coming from in the Linux world, it's usually libraries, like it's glibc, OpenSSL, blah, blah, blah. So if we would be able to actually live patch libraries for, for in, like the in-memory copies of libraries for applications that already are running with their own uh, copy of the library in memory, that would still be a huge win. So that's, that's currently what we are doing, and then actually gives you, or gives us, sort of the same boundary we have with the kernel user space, uh, and that's, that's the entry and exit from the library, which with some tricks, like we are basically hooking ourselves into PLT, into the procedure uh, linkage table that the dynamic linker provides. So we are actually tracking every entry and every exit through an exit trampoline um, from the library, and that way we are actually, so we currently have a prototype that works and we we'll hope to publish it shortly that allows to at least patch the system libraries. Okay, and that's, that's the current state. Any questions? David. Um, um, so, yeah. so Dave is asking whether anyone is working on tooling where you can actually just rebuild the patch and apply it and be done, right? So, so is the question about being able to trans transfer existing live patch across different kernel versions? Or, or just to take the upstream patch, oh, apply it, okay, rebuild so you, and do okay. a binary delta. We have that for Zen, right? We, can uh, we have that for Zen, and actually that's, that's uh, what, uh, what KPatch and KSplice actually did as well. So they basically take the source, source level, they rebuild, and they apply the patch rebuild again, do the binary comparison. Um, it turns out that it f for quite a f so, so So basically, it, yes, it's possible technically because there are there are implementations uh, that do that. We decided not to go that way upstream uh, for multiple reasons, actually. And uh, one of the reasons is that actually for many patches, it turns out you need facilities like callbacks, which I presented. So you actually have to do some preparatory work, then do the actual patching, then do some post-processing. And that's sort of 
not possible with this completely automatic thing. So, all right, so you always have to do some, write it manually somehow. Uh, it turns out that, for example, I think KSpice also had to implement it at, at one point. And then basically it makes it really, so we are a distro and we really want to have it maintainable for long periods of time. And with this, this would basically mean we are mixing, bin maintaining binary blobs with some sources that have to be, you know, the callbacks. So we actually decided, even together with Red Hat, who originally came up with this, this solution, we then agreed on not taking this path and actually having, having this source code based and not, not binary based. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, um, what are the security and legal aspects of this? So for example, do you enforce um, on the legal aspect? Do you require the patches at GPL? Or like, it, it, it seems like so with, it's a with the module subsystem, for example, there's only certain symbols you can get, and we can have security impacts of you know making sure certain things are read only, and you can't get access to stuff. It seems like this bypasses all of that. So it's kind of two questions in one. Um, so this is actually up to the patch author, right? So it's like the main thing is it's a kernel module. So that's, that's the principal form of it. So it can do whatever the kernel module can do. So it means that if, can, if it can access uh, the symbols via export symbol or export symbol GPL, it, it accesses them that way. If it can't, then it's of course up to the, up to the patch author to decide what to do. It's, I mean, it, in this respect, I don't see it in any way different from what any other kernel module code does. Okay. <laughs> But uh, does this mean you can't patch uh, functions which are not uh, exported, uh, well, GPL exported? Um, well, you, you technically you can do it, right? Because you basically just look up the address of the function, and that's that's the only thing you need basically. And you're you're not really violating anything because it's. It's a part of the kernel, and it's it, we are patching the kernel we are distributing. So it's it's basically the same as we would have just provided the the, the code we are patching in a separate module together, bundled with the kernel. So uh, you said that it aims at reducing a planned uh, downtime, mm -hmm. but in my opinion, it also reduces unplanned downtime by the fact that you can patch much faster. If, if you can apply your patch, your fix immediately, you reduce the likeliness uh, of your system going down due to, due to a bug. Yeah, I agree, I agree. And the, the point about the planned mi downtime was that you can actually, you don't have actually to plan for these patches because you can just apply them, but yeah, I agree, I agree. Steven? So, question about, um, is there a recommendation for how long you should keep uh, uh, a patched kernel uh, running, or is there a time where you should reboot it? Because uh, technically, whenever you start doing um, these live patches, you have uh, a bottomation of the kernel, because it's actually now this person's running a kernel that no one else is running. Because depending on, you know, if you have thousands of live patches, the combinations is, you know, incredibly large. Okay, so the answer to that is that actually, you're absolutely right, it would be impossible to maintain. So the way we chose to distribute it, and Red Hat, I think, is doing the same way, is actually we are distributing it accumulatively. So for, from a distro point of view, the user can't really choose, like I'm applying the patch number three and patch number 27. He basically just gets updated RPM, live, kernel live patch, and he just applies it and gets whatever is in there, and this package is getting updated for the particle kernel. So that way, it's not true that there are like gazillions of people running different combinations of patches. Everybody who is using this package has exactly the same code running. Also, of course, when whenever the, the live patch is inserted into the kernel, the kernel clearly marks that in every oops that it has been live patch, you can clearly see that the kernel is running this and that and that version of the live patch, so you can easily track that to, to the repo and so on. So, I completely agree. That was our primary concern that it would lead to an explosion of different codes running, and that's exactly one of the reasons why we decided to just distribute it as one thing that, that gradually grows. And then we are supporting basically code streams back for one year and a half, I think, and then we stop providing patches for the particle kernel. So that's not the recommendation, that's what we do for our customers. Yeah, so. Um if I understand correctly, you only distribute it uh, commercially, that's correct? It's not, uh, 
Um, is, it, is it in a distribution I can install and? Uh, so we, we don't provide live patches for OpenSUSE. We do provide them from rel, for rel, uh, for Slice, sorry, Red Hat does provide them for, for rel. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so, so the live patches are not there for OpenSUSE kernel. You can get them, so it's, it's the, the repository we are tracking is available somewhere. So you can actually look at the patches, you can recompile them, but we don't support them and provide the binaries for OpenSUSE. But if you okay. want to look at the patches we are distributing and play with them, they are there. Okay, uh, my next question is how do you do live patching of uh, kernel modules? For example, if a module isn't used by said uh, machine? So in principle, it's not, not different if the module already is in the memory. So if the module has been already mod probed before the, the live patch for it came, it's exactly the same like patching the kernel. You're right, there is an issue when you actually have a live patch for a module that's not present in memory yet. And there is actually, so there are two ways how to deal with that. Either you patch the on-disk format, or basically on-disk the, the .ko binary patch it so that it actually is patched next time it's mod probed. I know that that's what Steven back then uh, proposed. We're not doing that. We are actually doing, uh, whenever we see that the module is coming for which we have a live patch, just before we, we let it link and so on, but just before the module is actually brought into life, so before the kernel starts seeing it and executing its code, we live patch it immediately. So, so it's handled that way. Um, yeah, there is another option for, for reasons we are not doing it, but it's definitely possible as well. I have another question. Uh, how do you, is, is your tooling available? You said you had the uh, patch GCC, for instance, and, um, and so, so the GCC, is, yeah. So the GCC patch, for example, is already in upstream GCC, the one that, that dumps the information about what has been in line where that's upstream GCC already. Uh, most of the tooling is upstream. Um, so there is uh, this, no, sorry. Blah, 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 blah. Where is it? No. There's a link somewhere to the best practices for, oh, here. So there is this, so it, for historical reasons, it lives here, uh, the k-patch. There's, this document is actually best practices for patch authors, things to be aware of and so on. That's currently even in the documentation live patch somewhere in, in the current git tree. And the tooling is there as well, and we are slowly, that's the part which is in progress, we are actually, wants to move this tooling to the current proper, so somewhere to scripts or tools or whatever, but that's, that's not done yet. That's work in progress. Thank you. I'll do it before I just ask. Hi. Do you ver verify uh, with cryptographic um, systems uh, the patch you're actually deploying, like on runtime? Do you that, sign it or anything? That's a very good question. So yeah. As I said, it's a, it's a normal standard kernel module, so it's livepatch.ko. So if you have in your kernel module uh, signature verification turned on, you get it for free, because you basically only allow, so we are a SUSE Linux distributor, so we actually sign all of our modules. So when the customer didn't override the setting, he basically is guaranteed to only have the modules which we provided to him, because all the modules are signed. And by default, our kernel is actually checking the, the module signatures. So we get this completely for free from the module uh, infrastructure. So just, just another question. And when you have another live patch update, do you like unload the first uh, live patch KO and uh, load the other one? Or? Um, no, it's, as I said to, to some of the previous questions, it's actually incremental. But w when you load the next one, eventually when the system converges to the fully patched state, uh, the, the old patch can actually be removed in principle because the code is guaranteed not to be running because everybody is running the new code. But yeah, it's, it's stacking up one on top of the other. Okay, that makes sense. So basically you're duplicating it. Okay, I'm going to ask a question um, that might, if you don't know about the answer or something, it might really scare you. <laughs> what do you do about the big switch in ftrace? There's a switch that turns off all ftrace function calls in the sys code. Are you even aware of that? Probably nothing, no. <laughs> so if you're running a patch kernel and you've switched this, you just went to the original, back to the original code in one shot. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, <laughs> we need a talk. Okay. Well, that would be, that's easy to, to overcome though, right? We'll basically just 
prevent the switch Preve from prevent the switch from happening yes. when there is a yeah, yeah. but thank you Um, as a sysadmin, my question is, how do you keep track f uh, of patching uh, for unexpected reboot, for example? Okay, so uh, that's, a, that's also a very good question. So the package, as we, so that's not provided by the internal infrastructure, but we as a distributor actually provide this as an RPM that's being updated from our update channel. And actually, each and every time you receive a new live patch, it, we actually update the uh, initiality of the kernel you are running so that next time you actually reboot, you get the module again mod prop during boot. So it's safe uh, across the boot. We're, of course, at the same time, you also receive the patched kernel from, from the update channel. So if you didn't override that, and many admins actually do override that because they really want to be in control which kernel they are installing at what, what point to, to the system. So either you reboot into a new kernel that has all the patches like native, or if you just for some reason locked down update of the kernel RPM, you have the p live patch model in, in the in RD and it will appear again after reboot. There exists sysadmins who will let you ship automatic live patches, but don't take the rebuild Sure. <laughs> sure, because updating the kernel is a big thing, but live patch is small RPM, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever reasons, but they do exist. That's it? Okay, thank you.